Okay, welcome to episode 29, Construction Nation. This is Sue Dyer, your host of Construction Dream Team, where I interview industry leaders and experts so you can learn about the people side of construction and build your construction dream team based on OPE, other people's experiences. Why not learn from others who've already been out there and doing it and learn the lessons so you don't have to learn them yourselves? This should be able to allow you to build your team much faster, better, and smarter. So I hope that every, all of you will also take a look at constructiondreamteam.com slash resources, especially if you're having a challenge and you're feeling like, man, I'm not sure what to do. On that page, we have accumulated all of the resources that have been recommended by every guest that has been on Construction Dream Team. So there's a whole bunch of things there for you to look at and learn from that are the best of the best, the recommended resources from the guests. So take a look at constructiondreamteam.com slash resources. So today, I am very excited to introduce you to our guest, Brian Polkinghorn. I have known Brian and admired Brian for quite a few years, decades, and uh, he is he's just a fabulous person, and I'm so excited to have him here. So let me tell you a little bit about Brian. Brian is a distinguished professor, and he's going to have to tell us what that means, because I know it's a big deal, because every time I talk to other professors, they say, oh, that's a big deal. So I know it's a big deal. <laughs> uh, he's also program director and department uh, head of conflict analysis and dispute resolution at Salisbury University, and also the executive director of the Center for Conflict Resolution at Salisbury University. A little bit more about Brian is he is accomplished in all sorts of different types of conflict resolution and intervention, including mediation and arbitration, and yes, even construction partnering facilitation. And he also works both domestically and internationally. And today we're going to talk a lot about his international work because it has been in those areas of the world that have the highest conflict. Yes, all those ones that are in the news where there are really thousands of years of conflict, and yet he's able to create agreements amongst the folks. So he is uh, also uh, very much involved in both state, federal, all sorts of different levels of conflict. And I also wanted to just mention that he has worked in South Africa Israel, Palestine, Nepal, Bosnia, Colombia, and North Ireland. So you can see it's those areas where we really need the help, and that's where Brian has been. As well as doing a lot of research, he was part of the research team for the new ACRP collaborative partnering study that just came out. So he has a wealth of knowledge to share with us. And so I welcome you to Construction Dream Team, Brian. Wow. Thanks, Sue. Nice to be here. Well, tell us about how you came to have the center at Salisbury, because that seems so interesting. And also tell us what the heck is a distinguished professor. A distinguished professor is somebody who sticks around long enough and they can't get rid of them. <clears throat> and you're uh -huh. <laughs> And uh, on a serious note, it's, it's uh, a designation for uh, either from your field or from your university, saying that you distinguish yourself in teaching, research, mentorship, uh, community service, that kind of thing. And primarily, they look at things such as your contribution to the advancement of skills and knowledge and that sort of thing in your designated field. So there could be distinguished professors in various disciplines and areas of study. And, cool. Yeah, and the center is a conglomeration of ideas that I've had that go back. Is it okay if I start a little bit further back and how I kind of got to the center? That'd be great because that way other people can see the path and maybe they take a similar path. Well, I, uh, gosh, I hope not. Because <laughs> 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 it was uh, zigzaggy and it wasn't by design. And some of the things I and people I ran into and the work that I did is because I literally fell in backwards to it, not even knowing it was there. But uh, I wasn't set on a fixed path when I was, uh, you know, in the beginning of my professional development, in the beginning of my career. So I had a, I had a professor, a blind professor, who would read 
stories and give us the latest news and things that she thought was interesting before she would start class. And this is back in 83. And, uh, you know, I listened to her. And one day she brought up this uh, distinguished professor, this, this pretty famous guy who actually came out of London. He's an Australian guy. He's at the university. He was leaving our university and going to go to George Mason University in Virginia to start this Center for Conflict Analysis and Resolution. And it just caught my ear, like, a Center for Conflict Analysis and Resolution? What is that? And I, and I knew of this professor because his sidekick was one of, one of my primary professors. So I went and talked to him and I contacted the, the folks over at George Mason. And then a year later when I graduated, I went to grad school there. And I didn't know this at the time because I was young, but the people that they had assembled from around the world at George Mason was a veritable who's who. They're legends in the field, either in research or in practice and whatnot. And I was getting advice from certain people about if you're going to be in this field, you got to do certain things. And um, I went from George Mason to Syracuse for my PhD and then Harvard Law School's program on negotiation. And, and while I was up there, I had people saying, no, you have to write two hours a day, no matter what. Doesn't matter if it's a religious holiday. You got to write. You got to publish or perish. You know, it's typical Ivy League thinking. And then I have other people saying, if you don't practice, you're perpetrating fraud because it's basically we're in a practice field. And you, you'd better know what you're talking about. And then I had a chair of my dissertation. Her name is Rosemary Leary. And she basically said, just, just do what makes you happy and you'll succeed. You know, if you got a passion for it, you'll do fine. And I wanted to do the research end of things, but on a practical side, and I want to do the practical side of things, but generate new knowledge. And so I figured there's nothing out there. The field's brand new. So the other universities I went to, I actually launched PhD programs and things like that. So we started with a blank slate. I didn't have to fit in to somebody else's mm -hmm. model. And so we built, when I was down in Florida, we built a program that was highly practical. We had this academy where we went out and worked with various communities and whatnot. And it could be construction, it could be highways and bridges, it could be memorials, it could be parks, whatever. But we worked on the human factor side of things to see where people stood on these projects and to have them work with it so they can kind of take some ownership of it. So when I came here 20 years ago, to Maryland, to Salisbury University, they had this center, the Bosman Center for Conflict Resolution, it's what it's called now, and uh, it has a practice side to it, and it has a research side, and then across the street, I uh, helped build a undergraduate program, and then a grad program in the department. So the center is broken into three units, or three like teams, so we have a practice team that does all the, res uh, the, all the workshops, and all the trainings, and service stuff, and then we have a research team which does things like construction partnering research. And then we've got the teaching team, which is the academic side. And it all plays with each other. And you never, you never get bored. If I was just teaching, or if I was just practicing, or just doing research, I could see myself getting bored. But we're always moving around. We have all these students working with us on all these projects. And they all feed off one another. So that's the teaching hospital model we have here. And people have taken notice. We've got uh, we're the number two ranked graduate program in the United States, but the center has a, like a, a international recognition. We get called by governments around the world to work on specific cases or to consult with them on, on tough issues. So you mentioned teaching hospital models. So tell us how that plays out in your world. So not too many graduate programs in our field have that model, the teaching hospital model. So by analogy, if I were a uh, a surgeon or whatever, I would have young doctors come watch me do it, and then they they learn how to do it and they go off and do it. And so, if somebody's with me for two years, they better be able to not only go out with me and see how it's done and do the basic stuff. They're trained in a classroom first, obviously, and then we go out and do it. And then I get to a point where, depending on the person's or people's level of ability, and they picked it up, I'll get a call from another university and they'll say, "Hey, would you come do this?" And I say, "Hey, I've got I've got three grad students that have been working with me since their undergraduate days. They're really good at this. I'll come up, but can they work with you and let them do the work? And it really helps out because it, it, it's a career launcher. You know, there's one thing to have a, a degree in something. There's another thing to have experience in it. And, and yeah, of course and, and, and it's, I, I mean, my, from my experience, you can't really learn how to be a neutral or how to resolve conflicts, especially con complicated uh, cases, 
uh, and without practice. I mean, there's, it's sort of like you can, it's, it's an intellectual thing until it's not, and you have to right. actually deal with people and you have right. to figure out what you're going to do and what you're, how you're going to make it happen. Yeah. Yep. And, and people, there's, and there's art to it as well. So, right. There's an art and science. That's exactly yes. where I was going. Yeah. So the art thing is going out and doing it because people throw stuff at you all the time. They try to get you off your neutral and partial stance and whatnot. And in, for them, it might be a game. Or could it just be that they uh, have a bad personality and they just like to fight all the time? And so they're constantly testing you. You can't teach that in the classroom. You got to yeah. throw them out. You got to put them in the lines then and see how they do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And then, yeah. and then they, if they don't do well, that's okay. But they've learned because the next time they're going to learn what they could do. Right. You learn a lot from mistakes. So there's a lot to be learned. So it sounds like the, uh, the, the Center for Conflict Resolution, tell us a little bit more about, is, is, is it, where, how does it play into these three sections you've got, you know, where you've got students that are the faculty that is learning, students that are doing research, yeah. and students that are doing uh, the practice? I, I describe it to the university and the community is that uh, the center is like a sandbox and uh, everyone can bring their toys and play. So it, it doesn't have any boundaries. There's no litmus test or anything. If somebody's got a case and they want to work on it, the center's a place to go. We just happen to have three really strong units in here, like a one-stop shop. So if they want it, so let's say a big corporation is building a solar field out in the countryside and they are having problems with uh, trying to get it through the local government and then the environmentalists have some questions and the farming community has some questions. We help them frame it up from, a, uh, say, a cons consultant perspective. But if they want an intervener, well, we can do that too. And if they want to track the progress of this process, we have the research to do it as well. So depending on what they want, we can primarily provide everything they're looking for, alpha to omega. That's very exciting. So I'm sure that there'll be some people listening who could take note of that and perhaps find you that you could help them as well or yeah. take the approach. Yeah. You know, you know, you you mentioned something I wanted to bring up. Uh, there's like the the human factor, the the human communication piece to basically good leadership and problem solving and whatnot. And students like to mediate; they like to intervene and things like that. But I also tell them on the science side, you need to understand those models and theories. You need to see how, say, the partnering process works, what it's designed to do, and be able to figure out how to operationalize and do the research. And uh, frankly, on a on a, just a livability note, there's there's uh, a decent living to be made in doing these sorts of research projects. It's one thing to be a practitioner; it's another one to advance your practice by being doing that applied research work. And so we really we really hit the doctrinal baseline stuff. You need to know the research. You need to know how to do these methodologies. You know how to do these processes and close the loop. Yes, and I think it's so important in conflict resolution or conflict prevention. Best, yeah. best, best effort is to prevent it because it's so many people think it's um, either magic or mm -hmm. they think that it's uh, too subjective. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I think that's really important to have the foundations of showing them the processes that actually create a result <laughs> that are effective yeah. and yeah. create a result. Yeah. So I know you've been leading for a long time there. You've been leading in the industry and really leading in the world. What do you think is your greatest strength as a leader? Uh, well, I don't know if I'm a leader, but I would, I would say this when I work with people, I, I like, first of all, you start off respecting who they are and what they do, appreciating everything that they're putting into this thing, accepting them basically for who they are and working. I, I think of it this way. When I work with somebody, and especially it's you no, know, you're, you're on audition. It's like a honeymoon and whatnot, but I really rather know the person rather than the project because it could be another project later on. And so if I'm, if I'm leading, it's, uh, it's from the middle or uh, what I like to do with my students is get them comfortable and kind of push them in front and put them out there. And uh, it doesn't matter who takes the credit, just as long as we do good work and get the job done. So, yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. So let's jump in and start talking about what we had promised on this episode is that I know you've traveled all over the world to some of the areas with the greatest conflicts that exist on earth. Can you give us some examples of kind of projects you've worked on and things you've done and how it's come together despite the innate conflict? 
Well, yeah, uh, we could go on for a long time here. So I'll, I'll just cherry pick some of them. But you mentioned South Africa, I think. And <clears throat> I've, I've been down there since the 90s and uh, the transition from apartheid to democracy. And it's just not a smooth transition to have something like that uh, big in a country occur. So all the best intentions, institutions start to malfunction and people who need the experience that didn't get the experience, now they're thrust in the leadership. And even something simple like locating wells uh, out in the countryside, you get a you get a geochemist or a hydrologist and they say, oh, you should put the well here because this is the best place. And it's, no, that's not where it goes. It's gonna go next to the chief's hut because the chief walks the shortest distance to the well. So they don't understand the human side of things, but um, South Africa is just, that's super complex and with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And, and so I think that country taught me something that the, the humanity of it's more important than anything else. You're gonna, you're gonna get a solution, but um, if it's inevitable, you may as well take your time and do it right. That's what I learned from them. But I've been in Israel and Jordan and West Bank uh, about 25 years. I used to live out there and um, in 2000, nine and 10, I just took my family. The kids were small then, and we just threw them in the local schools and we stayed there for a year. And I wound up toward the end of our stay, getting hijacked by a bunch of my buddies, some Palestinian, Jordanian, and Israeli guys that were working separately on desert research, agriculture in the desert, that sort of stuff, and uh, water technology. And these scientists speak the same language. So a geologist in Jordan will speak the same geology as in the West Bank or in Israel. And so there's a common thread there. And they kept on saying, well, we want to make this bigger. We want to get this organized. And I kept on resisting it because I didn't go to Israel or the West Bank to work on that project. But at the end, they kind of talked me into it. And they do cross-border water cooperation. They share their technology. They share their experience. Uh, the world's leading people on water and desert research uh, is found right there. The, the best, the, like the three top institutions in the world are in that region. And they should be exchanging ideas, but because of the politics, they can't look like they're cooperating or collaborating because that could have really bad consequences for the individuals involved. So by having some outsiders like me and some guys from, guy from MIT economics department, a guy from the business school at Harvard and two people from Oxford, we kind of set this framework up to bring them in so that they can talk. And, and I tell you what, uh, these are all very good people. The region needs water and you never deny water to anybody. So if that's the case and you've got some way of harvesting water at night in the desert, they're going to share that technology. So in a sense, they were just looking for a venue to be able to do good things. They were going to do good work, but they had these obstacles in the way. And by getting us involved, those obstacles became surmountable. So another role for the neutral that can actually allow people to come together, and it happens even on construction projects uh, where people are so entrenched or they're afraid to talk to one another. And so the allowing that neutral body to come together mm -hmm. uh, allows people to have a venue for a dialogue. I got a, I got a case, a construction industry case right now uh, that we're working on at the center. So I don't really want to say too much about what the case is, but you'll know in a year because it'll be national news. It's a big deal. And these guys got together for a kickoff and somebody showed up, a big shot showed up and said, hey, this isn't just a construction project. This is a national monument. And I worked with this person and gave this round, I mean, just 360 on the importance of this figure and the impact that he had on the United States and the world, and that this is an honor of him, and that this is like hallowed ground. You're going to use the best material, and you're going to cooperate. You're going to do what he wanted to see done, and, and you got to channel this guy. And it's been one of the smoothest cases I've ever worked on, because you just, when do you, when do you get into a, a scenario where you're like, you're emotionally drawn into it? This isn't just I'm building something. This is something that's going to have to last when my great grandchildren are still around. I mean, it's it was a very good psychological move. These folks took ownership of it. They weren't being asked to buy into something, and it's it's a really good project. So and I think that's again a great lesson learned. I remember years ago working on a city hall project, and it you know the city hall was built in the 1800s, and 
the um, historian came in with all the trades there and everyone in the partnering process and brought the actual plans that the architect, original plans the architect had created. And it was 50 pages to build this <laughs> city hall. And she talked about the building and she brought pictures and a PowerPoint. And she talked about how important the founding fathers of this city had created this building to be a destination on mm -hmm. the West Coast so that people from the East Coast would come. And uh -huh. it really kind of developed Hollywood and it developed a lot of things in Southern California because of this building. Mm -hmm. And you're exactly right. Everyone there that knew they were building something special. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember also doing something similar with a VA hospital where you bring the veterans out who are going to live there and have them talk about their stories. And so everybody in Construction Nation, you can do this on your project. Mm -hmm. Every project has a reason that it is being built. I remember even building a freeway when it got opened up. People were laying on the freeway looking at the ceiling and looking, <laughs> looking around because they, they owned it. They took ownership of it. Mm -hmm. and I think that's a great lesson, Brian. You know, you know um, that makes me think this. there's not too much interplay between, say, the social sciences or humanities and, say, engineering and construction. But I think it's Drexel University has a master's degree in peace engineering. So you go out and you, you're getting an engineering degree, but they have courses in the social sciences. So you understand the ramifications and consequences on the local community of the work that you do. So it gives you this big holistic picture. So that's another thing. And if you tune in to people who have concerns that aren't engineers or architects or whatever, or in the construction industry, but they're impacted by it, and you listen to them and you use their language, they become a part of the process. They, they're not as much inclined to resist, but to provide in to, uh, input and good details and ideas. I had this with a, a case with a, a turnpike around a city in Virginia. And all I wanted to do before I met with the construction people was be out in the community. And he said, well, can we take part? And I said, yeah, you're part of this. Why not? So I told the construction people, they're like, what are you doing? And I said, you want the best and brightest ideas up front early on in decision making and planning and all these sorts of things, they're going to be using this. It's going to be going through their communities. Let's give them a voice. And it worked. I had to, I had to kind of coach the engineers to be more humane and listen. And, you know, you got two ears and one mouth. Let's listen twice as long. And it worked very well. So they That's took ownership awesome. of it. That's awesome. So with the water agreements that you've developed, uh, how do they come to fruition? Is it, is it really sharing technology uh, or are they somehow sharing water? Oh, th it's all sorts of stuff. And th this, by the way, is not, so there's a, it's called Red Sea, the Dead Sea Canal. It's really a pipeline. <clears throat> that's a totally different project. It's a multi-billion dollar project that's supposed to solve all these problems. This is for people who live in small communities in the desert. So it could be in the Negev, or it could be on the Jordanian side, or it could be anywhere in the West Bank. And what they what we do is we had to kind of calm these guys down. Uh, there were some really ambitious projects that they wanted to do right off the bat and said, you know what, we need to show people outside this room that we can work together. Let's pick some small projects, like fifty thousand dollar size things like how to do waste energy or showing new agricultural techniques or drip irrigation. Just show them little things and and get them working. But it's it's the sharing of knowledge, it's the sharing of technology. The Israelis give away a lot of their stuff. So if they come up with a new technique or a new instrument, they want to share it. So people come from around the world and pick it up. Well, why don't? Why, what about our neighbors? What about the Egyptians and the Jordanians and the, the Palestinians and the Lebanese? And so it's it's just a venue for them to have work together on something and to share. And I think people want to share. You know, the, the last thing you want to do is in the desert is deny somebody water. Yes. And, and, you know, the best way to make a friend is you're, you're thirsty, you're out in uh, a, uh, a canyon area and people running low on water and you give them a couple of liters on the way out because, you know, you're going to make it back to the town. Like, hey, why don't you take, you know what, you made a friend for life. So yeah, and I'm thinking, too, just all around the world, you know, water, of course, we need that to live. But we also need it to grow food. And so, you know, water is so essential to every part and every culture. 
uh, within the, the entire world. Yeah. Uh, so I'm but thinking that th there, this model might be good to use in other venues too. So think about that, people. I got I got one that, and I'm always fascinated by these experts and they they talk and they get along and then, you know, in the, in the Middle East, people can be friendly and they can be tough. And in Hebrew, it's sabra, it means prickly pear, tough on the outside, but sweet on the inside. They can be gruff, but they're gonna they're gonna take care of you. So I went down into the desert with these guys. So we had some Jordanian, Palestinian, Israelis, and some Americans. We had a we went on a field trip. We went out to this center, and what they're doing, and it's in the kibbutz, and they're they're working with ratios like what's the minimal amount of soil and the minimal amount of water we can get this plant to grow a tomato, and it, it's amazing. You can see the roots because there's so little soil, and the reason being is everything's scarce. So how can we be smart with what we have? Like in the United States, if if we saw somebody with a lawn in Israel, first of all, you wouldn't see it. They don't have they don't have grass or the West Bank. But if you saw somebody with a sprinkler just spray, you know, sp sprinkling water around, people would come and say, "Stop wasting water. Turn turn that damn thing off. You're causing a problem." So what they do is they figure out uh, in a I would say ingenious or crafty or creative way to get plants to do this. And some of the so you go to these markets and whatnot and these fruits and vegetables literally got they were picked the day before and they came up on a truck and, and from the desert it's wow. amazing yeah it's that, amazing that what they sounds do. amazing yeah. yes cool well tell us a little bit about what you've done in nepal i've worked on the peace process <clears throat> so um you know we were talking about you know you learn from doing things right you learn from mistakes and whatnot and <clears throat> in in the nepal case and this has been going on since 2007. Uh, so, by the way, so a lot of these cases, you go in, you think you're going to work for a little while, and you realize it's going to be the rest of your life, you know, working with these folks. But after the Civil War, they had the Nepal, uh, uh, New Delhi, the Delhi Pact, and um, part of it had to deal with g giving land back that was taken by the Maoists, and uh, so the redistribution, you know, ancestral homes, and things such as education and revamping the police and the military and taking insurgents and either retiring them or putting them into canton so they could start a start a business and whatnot so it looks good on paper <clears throat> but when we were working on it so the carter center was there and obviously all these embassies the united nations but to make a long story short it looked good on paper but they didn't think through the full implementation and enforcement of these things so when they got back to nepal people had different interpretations of what they agreed to. So for the first hundred days you're there, you know, there's the government's supposed to do this. They didn't do anything. And for gosh, it took like eight years to get the first things rolling. And it was, I'm still involved. I probably, it's tested my patience. <laughs> but it's not like, I gotta be very careful. It's like, this is, these are their issues. They have to live with them. When I go home at night, uh, I'm not dreaming about this stuff. That's that's their existence. So you know, as a third party person, we always have to be very mindful of do no harm. And at the same time, you yes. just wonder: are these were these folks? Some of these folks acting in bad faith. And so that kind of tests your your wherewithal. But, yes, it uh, does. And I always mm -hmm. talk about you know I've been done a lot of stuff overseas, but I've done some big uh, interventions uh, with very, very, very large organizations. And I always talk about it sort of being evolutionary as opposed to revolutionary. Mm -hmm. Because if it's too revolutionary, it doesn't really stick and you get too many people working against you. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to just sort of take the long view and then and just it, it just it just keeps moving. And as long as there's movement, people feel like, okay, we're making progress. Mm -hmm. uh, even, and then eventually you do hit a tipping point and it, and it does fundamentally ship, but you still have to keep pushing it forward or it doesn't stick. Yeah, so those people <clears throat> taking a long view on these things, they have to have an idea where what's on the horizon, <clears throat> but you might be talking two horizons out, two bounces of the ball, but at least they have a mile marker in, where, in which to, at least aim, <clears throat> aim their efforts. <clears throat> Excuse me. But um, sorry about that. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> but, well, uh, you're busy. People want yeah, you. <laughs> yeah, somebody, somebody should be answering the phone. But, <laughs> but you know, the um, here's another thing to think about when you're working with international organizations. Some of them can be state actors and they have to follow the rule of law, and others aren't state actors and they can go and change their mind. If you're working with an organization, say like the federal government and whatnot, 
they've got rules and regulations. There's only so many things you can do without people saying, hey, hold on a second, that, that doesn't pass the smell test. And so there's something to kind of keep people on their lanes. But when you're dealing with these other people who just, I don't have to live by those rules, then it becomes a, a pretty good challenge. That's one of the things. Yeah. So if you're if you're on a case, you got a you got a case where everyone in the room represents a state government or a federal government or a local government, you're hopefully in pretty good shape because they know how to cooperate with one another. Then you get that one or two entities in there who basically play by different rules and they want to change the game to play by their rules. Then then you have to think strategically as the intervener. Well, what's the rule of law? Is this, is this, are we making it up on the fly? Where do we have our wiggle room and where do we have to stay within the law? So that becomes another thing a lot of people don't think about yeah, in terms yeah. of like getting problems solved. And you have that even like on a construction project, it may not be the rule of law that's uh, the state governmental, but it's the cultural laws, right. the different entities who come together and, and and I see it a lot, for example, like project manager from the construction side, who's completely and totally empowered to make any decisions within the amount of budget they have. And then the project manager for the owner's side, who has sometimes, a lot of times, no power mm-hmm. to make a decision. And then the project manager for the architect, who has little power to do anything but influence the one one or the other of these the other two mm-hmm. so um yeah it, you know it, the power imbalances are are real and i get another re- another reason to use uh neutral yeah you, exactly and, and you know like there's uh, i'm just gonna throw one little bit piece of theory here so lewis Kozer is the functions of social conflicts he basically says you if you have people working on something we'll call them adversaries and air quotes here but you want them to have about the same amount of power so that they can work together because if one's totally disempowered you're working with the weakest link but that's that's inside like a closed system of the construction project well think open systems for a minute could you imagine the same crew working say building a casino on an indian reservation and then you've got local pluralistic group sorts of sense of justice and then you've got these guys working on contracts with established state laws that could be if it's not done right a real train wreck and so i've had cases over the years where I'm not really dealing with the construction project. I'm dealing with the grinding of the gears between the local community that is just totally aghast that they're taking down all these trees, which is a part of nature, to build this casino, which they don't want in the first place. It's, so there's things outside that fishbowl that people need to be mindful of. And if you look at the big picture and have that in mind when you're making decisions and you're, you know, you got the right people at the table, hopefully, if, if anything, even if it goes wrong, they'll say, you know, it's Sue's a good person. She did her best. She tried to understand where everyone's coming from. They give you the benefit of the doubt. And let's face it, in our industry, what's the only thing we have to protect? And it's our, it's our reputation. Yes. So, yeah, yes. so do, you know, do no harm. Yes. Yeah. And our projects have more and more people, whether it's Indians or historical issues or right. environmental issues. I mean, yeah, we have we have more and more of that railroads where we're impacting communities. Where, you know, so, right, right. Yeah. So I know you have helped to resolve conflicts in these high conflict areas around the earth. What advice can you offer to construction leaders who must deal with conflict within their teams? <laughs> this is another dissertation. Um, there are, I would say this. People, are, people go to university or they get licensures or accreditation to put more tools in their toolbox and they want to use the tools. But if you're a geochemist and you're dealing with a, a water dispute in a local community that could be like an environmental justice issue, whatnot, you need to know something about the perspective of the people you're working with and appreciate where they're coming from. I might be an expert on geochemistry, but they're an expert on having four of their five kids with childhood cancer. And so it's, it's a framing perspective, but just taking into consideration, and some of this is like you learn it in kindergarten, to be respectful of others and let them talk and try and understand what they're saying and reflecting back what they're doing. The other thing is, in some of these bigger cases, is I'm using the word language in multiple forms here, people speak different languages. So to use the word collaboration, say in the Middle East, has multiple meanings, and some of it is just not good. 
even the word consensus in some communities is not a good word. You don't use it. So you have to be careful with that. But there's other language. So we've got architect and engineering language. And there's nothing worse than trying to get out of a mess with the public using the wrong language. So when somebody's angry or upset over the impact of a project, and, and somebody on your team is just talking about the engineering aspect of it, you're totally missing the human factor side. So they need to they need to know something about how to deal with an angry public, which by the way, Lawrence Susskind wrote a great book on how to deal with an angry public. Lawrence. And then the other thing I would say is people might be talking past each other and our job as the intervener is to sometimes translate from one language, say the construction industry language to a more common language that people understand. And I've literally had people say, oh, thank you so much for asking those questions. I had no idea what they're talking about. And I look at these people and say, I didn't either. That's why I'm asked. I'm not, I'm not trying to be Homer Simpson. I am Homer Simpson. I just had, <laughs> <laughs> what? Can you dumb that down a little bit more? And then and the other thing is, I would say that people need to think about being a moderator, not just of the dialogue, but if your demeanor, because if you're, if you're approachable and you can establish rapport with people and you've got the, you know, the right character, the right personality, people are going to come to you. You know, you're sort of a safe person to bring up tough topics and they got to get aired because, you know, you know, you and I know when a project goes bad is when people stop talking. And then, uh, then the other thing I'd say is this, when things are really rough and I've had some really rough, you know, heated discussions with people. Um, I remember one several years ago, I threw my back out and we had to go to this meeting and it was a performing arts center. And I was in a lot of pain and the air conditioning was not working in this hotel. So this conference room was blazing hot and I'm laying on the floor and the guys are fighting <clears throat> over, over really mundane little things. And I got up off the floor and, and, and for me, it's kind of like they knew I was using my words uh, as, as precisely as I could because there, I didn't have much energy and we had to do this thing. And I said something and I said, don't make me the bad guy. I'm not going to be your soft target here, but I'm going to drop a bomb on our position right now. It's kind of like an airstrike on your own position <laughs> and told him the worst case scenario. And, and, and I said, there's a worst case scenario and it is the best case scenario. All I want to hear from you guys is what is that best case scenario and how are we going to get there? And I'm going to go lay down on the floor. So I, t- <laughs> I was a referee on the floor and I think they had a little sympathy for me. And they said, you know, Brian's obviously in a lot of pain. This stuff is not working for him. Like, I, I don't know what I was on. It just wasn't working. But they, they cooperated out of sympathy and thought about the best case scenario. But sometimes we have to be referees, you know? Absolutely. And, yeah. So, well. so, so what I heard was perspective, language, translate, moderator, referee. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, so everybody yeah. out there, that's the process. Write it down. Work on it. <laughs> we should come up with a little acronym or something, but it, I don't know if that would make any sense. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, what what did, I know you've done worked on partnering as well on projects, and you've written some stuff for you know Maryland, and you've done research on partnering. What advice can you give the industry to better implement partnering on our projects? I, I would say uh, there are people who've been around who do partnering, but they don't know what it is, so they need to be educated in the sense that there's this framework that other people are learning because these young folks that are coming into the industry are familiar with it. So I guess uh, I did a study for the Maryland State Highway Administration because they saw coming down the pike a potential problem. A lot of the senior leadership with institutional history were in the process of retiring. And so they had instituted partnering in the state, but when they go, there's really very few people who had taken it up. But these, we found that the younger people coming in the state highway administration knew about it. Uh, they learned about it in a class and things like that. So we had some hope. And so what we did is we targeted the middle folks to get them. Uh, and we basically did some trainings for them. And then we showed them like well, what's going on in say Arizona and some other places through Ashto. And they were able to take the torch from the people. Some of these people in Maryland, by the way, they just won't retire. They're, they've been, 45 years with state highway administration they've got great history but when they finally do go they leave a big void so i would i would say this in terms of 
helping people with partnering projects is the, the education of the process, but also knowing that we're not asking them really to learn anything new. We're asking them to take what they know it works well, the best practice stuff, and line it up in a formula of sorts and make it their own. So we, you and I know that if you're, if you're working in Virginia or Michigan or here in Maryland, they might have a slightly different way about going to doing partnering, but it's pretty much the same thing. It's just like Baskin Robbins, a slightly different flavor, but it still has the same key elements. It still tastes the same. It's still yes. good. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. So shifting a little bit back to you, I'm sure we talked about, you know, that you're, you're really are world renowned. We know this. And <laughs> so, but I'm sure not everything has been perfect. Tell us about your worst moment you've ever faced. Oh, no. There's a lot of them. You know, there's nothing worse than than working on something really a long time with people. They put a lot of effort into it. It's like their baby. They built this thing. And then you find out, you go to implement it, and then somebody says, hey, I should have been at the table. Or worse, somebody was at the table who shouldn't have been there. But I, I've had cases where people have come to me and they said, I've got bad news. And we just signed the agreement and their legal team had reviewed it, but the legal team comes back and says, we can't do this. And so now what do we do? <clears throat> you spend 18 months working on this project and a key player is saying, I shouldn't have signed this thing. But I'll, t- I'll tell you this, um, when I think the creative people, creativity definitely comes into play when, you, when you're boxed into a corner. And we had a case in the Northeast United States where I'm just being generic here, where somebody signed this and she came back and she was mortified because she was on the wrong branch of government. And, and the, we held these, and it, and it, was, it was about uh, construction and, and throughout the entire state, but we held it on the legislative side because the legislature has the budget. They, they, they run the, all that. And this person was on the executive side. So we said, what the heck can we do? And one of the guys, and by this time, everyone who had taken part in this you know, we were about to have a big party and, you know, <laughs> fire trucks and water cannons and everyone's happy and whatnot. But one of the guys who was an attorney said, well, why can't we just change your signature saying your signature is as a witness to this process? So they ran around and talked to all the attorneys and they said, OK, we think we can do that in, in a past muster. But there's oh, gosh, I don't know if you've ever lost sleep over this. Like what what's non-obvious and unintended? What could possibly go wrong? I think about that stuff all the time, but that never, ever crossed my mind. And we'd, we'd prematurely sent out this, we got an agreement, the state's going to be able to go ahead and do these things around the state. And then literally within 24 hours, we're going, oh no. And the governor at that time was a real hothead. Luckily, the governor never found out. <laughs> but, you know, there's, there's failures. You know, I don't want to scare anybody off. There's, there's things that we do when we get into really heated conflicts that can cause people discomfort. Um, but my thing is this, it's better to look at it now and not avoid it and yeah. actively work on it and try and get it resolved. I've had instances where I think failure is going to occur. So sometimes you got to slow things down to, to speed them up and just stop the process saying, guys, there's too many, there's too many questions here, risking them not coming back to the table. But I can tell them that here's the consequences. And I've had an instance or two over the last 35 years where we stayed too long at the table. And, and then the, a, a group that really feels like they're getting the bad end of the deal. It could be an environmental regulation. It could be doing something like with putting a highway through agricultural community. <clears throat> we stay too long and uh, they leave on their own. I would rather invite them to leave, do their homework and come back. But we've had it where it's collapsed. And then you feel really bad because... They came in a good faith effort to yeah. work with people that they have big disagreements with to try and solve something, and then it didn't happen. And that, that kind of doesn't sit well. So I've yeah, had a couple yeah. of those. Well, uh, yeah, always there's a chance that it won't resolve, but uh, the chance that they try gives it an opportunity to. But also what I've seen is a lot of times it may not resolve then, but then it still percolates a lot. Yeah. And, you, and then later on, it may be, you know, depending on the time frame or other pressures that begin to emerge, uh, you aren't starting from all over when you start again. Right. And here's something to think about. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. I was going to say, <clears throat> you can have like 10 issues and you solve eight of them, but the last two are just sticklers. Yes. Well, it's a mini win and you got to congratulate them and say, these two, you're going to have to take to court. Uh, absolutely. That's you, still oh. a win. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 You, you wanna, and, you, you wanna, and you've created a pattern of resolution too. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're yeah. used to the log rolling on something positive yeah. at least. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what's the best advice you've ever gotten? <laughs> I think I said this, do, do what makes you happy. <laughs> I love that. If you if you got passion for what you're doing, then there's no reason. You, you're not going to a job. You're going to have fun. And, you know, you know people who say, I can't believe I get paid to do this. I absolutely love what I do. And then when you yes. when you get successful at it and you're helping people out and you see the results and, and people call back looking for you again, then you realize you've kind of found you're in the right place with the right people that are at the right time doing the right thing. Absolutely. But, yeah. So okay, what is your favorite piece of tech that you use that you find helpful? <laughs> That's a good question. I got to tell you, I'm a Luddite. You know what a Luddite is? <laughs> Somebody who doesn't like technology. But I, it's, it's, You mean you have a yellow pad? <laughs> <clears throat> yes, I Yes, I do. <laughs> yeah. I like, I like talking to people face to face. And when you get in, into their office or into their community and you're getting familiar with what's going on it's a little different than being online or whatever but i also i also i I will say this there is one piece of technology i really like geographical information systems i really like gis because it makes everyone's on the same page the same map the same topography the same resource thing and they can work on it that way so that's that's a good that technology produces common ground but for other stuff like Facebook and Twitter or whatever, I, I don't LinkedIn. I'm on none of that. And and the reason being is if I'm supposed to be neutral and confidential and discreet and whatnot, uh, people don't want to see me talking about cases because uh, it could hurt my reputation for one thing and they won't use me, but I also want to protect what they've given me yeah. and, and leave it at that. So and the other thing is, if you want to do contract work with certain governments, they'll ask you things like, have you taken drugs, yes or no? And you click no, and they say, this interview is over. And then they, then they send out an investigator. But the other one they typically uh, stop the interview is, what social media, do you use social media, yes or no? And I say, no. And they say, this interview is over. <laughs> and then how can you not be using it? It's because people can put together from different parts of the internet things and figure out what you're working on and with what i do you just kind of some of the stuff we just we don't talk about period yeah. even even to the boss you just can't yeah they yeah. just got to uh, trust that you're working on something so yeah. i'm sorry about the but gis is the answer that's my final answer <laughs> yeah, well that kind of leads to my next question so oh. if someone wanted to get a hold of you how did they get a hold of you smoke signals no it's teasing they, they, could, they, could, they could always call me i mean no actually i have a i use my email i mean that's that's that i just never send anything confidential over email in the center for conflict resolution the bosserman center there's two ways to get to it one is conflict hyphen resolution.org and you'll find us the other one's bosserman center and it'll take you to the same place and, okay. and yeah and you can find and out we'll put that in the show notes so with all okay that, yeah okay they can get a hold of you that way. Yeah. And so what is your parting advice for all of us, Brian? How what can we do maybe starting today or tomorrow to deal more effectively with conflict? Have you a thought about this not uh, for this interview but for a workshop I just did at a community college the other day and the, and they asked some simple things and at the end of like what what can we do? And and I said, well, you know, do no harm and and you know you you work in a contractual environment, do something non-contractual, something you don't have to do to make things easier for other people, such as you know who's making the coffee kind of thing. But uh, one of the people who I work with is Mahatma Gandhi's grandson, Arun Gandhi. I know Arun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> tell him I said hi. Yeah, I will. In fact, I got to give him a call because we're we're planning a trip to India. And Arun, Arun basically took up his grandfather's cause. He made it yes, his own. He did, and yeah. yeah, and he's he's quite a character. We've traveled the world together and but uh, several years ago, these the editor in chief of a magazine called B, as in Be the Change You Wish to See in the World, contacted me on email and said, Hey, Merry Christmas, happy holidays, read this story. And this guy from the New York Times is a journalist and he likes to hunt down 
the origins of quotes. And he saw that, you know, be the change he was to see in the world on coffee mugs and on posters and T-shirts and billboards and all that. And he went to all the places I would have gone, including to India, to this place called the uh, Sabarmati Ashram. Obviously, a lot of people know that. But in the same town, Ahmedabad is the uh, Jugarat Vidyapith, which is in a university that Gandhi actually started. And he asked these folks, where did this come from? Did Gandhi say it? And they said, no, he didn't say that. And they gave him the long quote that Mahatma Gandhi said, and it's very long and lots of comments and whatnot. So the guy continued to search, and he found that in 1982, Arun and his wife, Sananda, were visiting the United States, touring around, and they were at Christian Brothers University in Tennessee. And a young student got up and said, hey, I wrote this quote down, but what does it really mean? And Arun thought, well, I should translate this into modern day, at the time, 20th century language for a college student. He says, I think what my grandfather is saying is just be the change you wish to see in the world. So Arun Gandhi is the originator of that quote, not Mahatma Gandhi. And he has a whole book he wrote about things his, things he learned from his grandfather, which I think is such a great yep. book. Too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, the most recent one's called The Gift of Anger. It's 11 lessons he learned from his grandfather. And I recommend anyone listening to this to get that book, The Gift of Anger. It's we'll, put an amazing, that, we'll put that on the in the show notes too. Yeah, it's, a, it's an absolutely amazing book. But um, I guess the last thing is, uh, in your own way, everyone wants to have a purpose-driven life and have meaning and whatnot. And at home and at work and whatnot, you want to be the person your colleagues want to grow old with. You're just a great character. People love you, Sue. You're, you're it, you know what I mean? And you're, you're being the change in your own way for the industry. So let's all just be the change we wish to see in the world. Have fun, be passionate about it. Absolutely, I love that. Thank you so much, Brian, for being on Construction Dream Team. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Hopefully we'll have more chances to do this uh, again and uh, talk about other other aspects of partnering specifically, because I know you've done an awful lot of work there. So maybe we talk about some of the research that's uh, come out and uh, and how people can apply it. That'd be great. Yeah, I'd love to catch back up with you anytime. Just give me a call. Thank, thank you. Okay, Construction Nation, wasn't this terrific? Brian is such an expert in his field, and I know there's so much to learn from him. I hope that you took away at least something that you're going to put action to, because just learning something or hearing it doesn't make any difference if you don't actually do something. And that's how you create your dream team. Apply these things that you're learning. So I know that there is a collective wisdom in the industry, and with this podcast, we're able to tap into that wisdom and you can have access to it and share this episode with anybody that you want to, whether they're in your team or they're part of your team or you're going to work with them, share it so that people understand where you're coming from because you've learned these things. And don't forget to, uh, we are now making construction scorecards available to any project that would like to use them. So just give me a ring uh, and you can either e- email me at sue at constructiondreamteam.com or you can uh, send us uh, a phone a phone message uh, at 925-449-8300 and we will uh, set up a call so we can kind of show you what it is and walk you through. So with that, we are going to say goodbye for this episode. Remember that every Monday morning at 4 a.m., Construction Dream Team drops and I will be interviewing another industry expert or leader. And so tune in then. And if you haven't subscribed, you can find us on any podcast uh, platform. We're everywhere. And uh, thank you so much, Brian, for being with us. I really appreciate it. And thanks, Construction Nation. I'll catch you next time.